This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man called David asking for information about how to place an advertisement for selling his laptop and other items. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories, if that's possible. Sure, that's not a problem. I take it you are a member of the Students' Union? Yes, I am. Right then, I'll just get a form up and as there is no one around and it looks as if it's going to be quiet for a while, I'll just type the details straight into the computer for you. Thanks very much. No problem. Shall we just title it Laptop for Sale? Yeah, OK. Can you describe it generally? Well, it's in very good condition. In fact, it's hardly been used. Why are you selling it, if I may ask? Well... I've got another one which is much lighter, and I don't really need to. I see. What weight is the one you are selling? It's 3.5 kilograms. That is heavy these days. Can you give more details about the one you want to sell? Right. Mm. Well, it's an Allegro, and it's got all the latest programs. OK. What about the memory? The memory is only 0 0.5 gigabytes. And what about the screen size and the other features? Well, um, the screen is, let's see, it's um, 37.5 centimetres with a standard size keyboard and a touchpad. But I've got a cordless mouse that I can put in with it if necessary. Some people don't like using a touchpad. What about ports or holes for attaching things to the laptop? It's got two ports. Hmm. More modern laptops have more than two ports for all the extra attachments. They do. Let's see what else is important. Oh, yeah. The battery lasts for two and a half hours, which is OK, but not enough for train journeys. But one thing is that it's not wireless. Right. OK. Not wireless. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you'll have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Anything else I can put on the advertisement? There's a webcam built at the top of the screen and I can throw in a printer, a scanner and headphones which I got with it in a special deal. It also comes with its own case for carrying it around 
Actually, the case is quite smart. I'm hoping these things will help it sell. They should do. Right, I think I've got all that. How much do you want for it? That I'm not sure about. It's worth about nine hundred pounds to a thousand pounds new. Yeah, but you won't get that much if it's used, and even if it's in good condition. What about five hundred pounds? I doubt if you'd get as much as that. More like two hundred pounds or three hundred pounds. If you look at the notice board, there is one on there which is comparable to yours, and it's not more than about two hundred and fifty pounds, I think. As little as that. I'm afraid so. Shall we say three hundred pounds? Okay, put that. Can I take some contact details for the advert? The name's David Bristow. B R I S T O W. Yes, that's it. And a mobile or email? Both, if you want. That's zero nine eight seven five four two three three eight seven. That's it. If you send the picture, I'll add it and print it out and stick it up for you. Okay, I can get that to you today. Right, I'll type in here. Advert placed the twenty second of October. Fine, and good luck with the sale. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear an announcement made by an official for the preparation plans for the town's two hundred and fiftieth anniversary celebrations. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. And now for the preparation plans for the town's two hundred and fiftieth anniversary celebrations, we are going to follow the same system we had last year, but with a few changes to increase the party spirit. First of all, this time we are going to make the concert on the beach open to everyone without charge. This is because we have been given money by the council for the celebration, and also because last year we had so many problems with keeping people out who had not paid. And on top of this, people will not have to pay for refreshments either, as these are being donated. Right now,、um, we are going to divide into four teams. The first one. The beach team will be responsible for cleaning up the beach on the Saturday morning, picking up litter, 
bottles, plastic bags, wood, and anything else that's lying around. Everyone is meeting at the beach shop at eight a.m. It's an early start, but we want to give everywhere a good thorough clean. We have had permission from the council to close the beach to get it ready for the anniversary celebration on Sunday. The second team will be responsible for setting out seating in the square for the speeches and prize giving. Again, an early start is preferable, but the vans with the seats can't be there until nine a.m. So shall we say that everyone should meet at the village hall at nine thirty? Starting then will allow extra time if the vans are late. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you will have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now the third team will be the judges. For each of the various competitions, we will have three judges. On the whole, they will have had experience of judging before. There will be a boat race, a swimming competition, and the best fancy dress. A cash prize will be given to the winner in each category. And for the two runners-up, there will be book tokens. There is a sponsored mini marathon, and by the deadline, lunchtime today, we had two hundred and sixty-three applicants with ages ranging from fifteen to sixty. That's eighty more than last year. Each entrant has paid a twenty-pound registration fee to enter. And all the profits will go to the local children's hospital to help fund much-needed specialist apparatus. The fourth team consists of the wardens for the day itself. We are expecting at least ten thousand people if last year is anything to go by. The fields near the entrance to the beach can be used as car parks, and we need wardens to help make sure the actual parking is more organised than last year, which was a mess. We also need someone to be in charge of the first aid, which will be at the entrance to the beach. Finally, we need some volunteers for the clean-up. Last year we didn't do this very well, and so the council has agreed to provide large bags to collect all the recyclable material, like glass and plastic, etc. But we have to deal with the rest, like leftover food, ourselves. We don't want to leave piles of rotten food around or dangerous bottles. That is the end of part two. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear a tutor and a student discussing a research project. First, you'll have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six.
Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Okay, is everyone ready? Over the past two weeks, we've been listening to different students giving a presentation on their research projects. So, for this morning session, I'd like to invite Susan to take the floor. For my project, I looked at different types of study techniques and tried to ascertain what students' opinions of the different methods were. I began with lectures because, of course, they're something we're all familiar with. Now, the problem with lectures is that you have to sit and listen for quite a long time, sometimes maybe as much as one hour. Yet, people's average concentration span is only about twenty minutes. This means, of course, within the first half an hour, most people actually stop listening, not consciously, of course, but you know what it's like. Your mind tends to, well, kind of wander. You start thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or about the party you attended last night. So I wanted to know what the most effective method of taking down all the important points was. Susan, if I may interrupt you, what's your strategy for listening to lectures? Personally, I always record the lectures. That way, you can listen to the lecture again afterwards and make really good notes. In fact, I know a lot of people who use this method. Yet, surprisingly, when I talked to students, they felt that it wasn't such a good method because the quality of the recording is often very poor. So, quite a few preferred to listen for the main points and take notes. Some even used a form of shorthand, you know, abbreviations and symbols, that sort of thing. Although everyone agreed that the best way to approach lectures was to do the required reading beforehand, that way it makes the lecture a lot easier to understand because you already know something about the topic. Could you tell us something about how students approach their assignments? You know, essays, reports, that sort of thing. Actually, when it came to assignments, people were divided on the issue of essay plans. Some thought it was a good method of planning. Others, well, didn't think so. Generally, though, most students didn't really express much of an opinion. Brainstorming, however, was different. You know, just sitting down and thinking of as many ideas as you can. Just about everyone said it was a really good method of preparing to write an assignment, especially if they got together in groups. This, they said, was by far the best method because it helped them to really analyze the issues. Discussing ideas was the same. In fact, many respondents claimed they often got together with friends for the purpose of discussing ideas, even if they weren't preparing an assignment. They said it helped them to understand the lectures better and, surprisingly enough, get better grades in their exams. Now, reading, like lectures, is a necessary part of student life, and we all know how much time we spend with our head buried deep in a book. But what exactly is the best way to read? Well, I discovered that hardly anyone tries to read the whole book or even whole chapters, but skim reading came out a real favourite. The majority of students I spoke to, in fact, found this to be a really effective technique because it saved lots of time, and it meant they could absorb far more knowledge this way. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you'll have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Susan, in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest problem students face at university? Time management. 
What I mean to say is that it's a much underestimated skill, and because it's underestimated, it's an area often neglected by students, especially young students who are used to other people planning their time for them. So I set about asking students exactly how they planned their time. Interestingly, however, nearly everyone said that time management was significant. Yet few people actually used the technique. Most commented that they were too busy with their studies. When it came to studies, I found that the vast majority of students worked part time, generally in the evening. Which most respondents claimed was the best time to study, because they'd been thinking about the subject all day, and many ideas were fresh in their minds. In fact, they said having to work was the biggest burden they had, because it meant they couldn't study in an evening and had to study on weekends instead, when they needed to relax and forget about their studies. A few of the respondents even said they got up early in the morning to study. On the whole, I found that time management is most people's biggest problem, and I feel that more should be done by the university to help students to plan their time more effectively. Sorry, Susan, but I'm going to have to ask you to start wrapping up now. We're quickly running out of time. Okay. Well, the final component of my research was the dreaded exams. Now I don't know about you, but I really hate exams. But when I talked to the students, I found that some students actually liked them. They were very much in the minority, though, and most students preferred not to have them. I was, of course, interested to learn just how students prepare for their midterm and end of term exams. And here, people were evenly divided on the issue. I found that most of the younger students preferred to cram. That is to say, they'd spend many hours just before the exam trying to learn as much as possible. Some even said they stayed up all night and never went to bed, and this was because they were too interested in their social life to pay much attention to exams during the term. Older students, however, were much more conservative. They tended to read much more widely and spend time thinking about the topic, making notes, and so forth. They did revise, of course, but they rarely spent time cramming. Cramming, they said, is of no use because you only remember the information for the duration of the exam and forget it afterwards. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a student talking about a survey conducted among people of different age groups to find out how architecture may affect people's lives. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. My group has been doing a project on the importance of architecture in people's lives, and whether it has any impact on the lives of people in general. The main part I have played is in the collection of data to find out what effect, if any, various buildings have on people's mood. I.e., whether ugly buildings make people unhappy, and whether beautiful buildings do the opposite. We had originally thought of starting measuring people's reactions by using a questionnaire with about forty questions, which we were going to hand out to people, including students at the university. But we were worried that doing the questionnaire would be too time-consuming for people to fill in, so we gave up the idea. I then asked several of the postgraduate students for advice. One of them came up with the simple idea of showing people images of various buildings from different eras and styles instead of giving out the questionnaire, and asking them to indicate how they felt on a scale of one to five about the images, where one was unhappy and five was very happy. People would also be given the option of not saying what they felt. Using the scale meant that it would be much simpler to record people's reactions. I decided to follow this advice, and so the first stage was to collect a large number of images. I used Google to print off color images of views of houses and apartment blocks where people live, and different types of buildings where they work. I started with about thirty or forty, and reduced them to ten images. Media resources in the Amory Building at the Judd Street branch of the university helped me produce the final images. I had them blown up to A4 size, and we used color rather than black and white to make the detail on the images clearer. We made five sets of images, and for protection when handling. We pasted the images onto hard card. Then, using a machine to wrap them with plastic, we laminated the cards. Five of us targeted different age groups. We went to a local school where we obtained permission to ask a group of teenagers between eleven and eighteen. We also asked a sample of the general public, including tourists from all over the world, as they exited the Tate Modern in London. What they thought. We aim to ask people from different age groups, namely twenty to forty and fifty and over. What our group learnt most from the project was, first of all, the value of teamwork, and secondly, we found that we had to appoint a leader to stop us pulling in different directions and falling apart. So this turned out to be an invaluable lesson for all of us. As to the findings. For us, they proved intriguing. In the end, the sample consisted of three hundred and eleven respondents. I thought initially that people wouldn't be interested in taking part. With the youngest age group, their reaction was very mixed. It was clear that the youngest group had no pattern of preference at all, as they frequently gave no reaction to the pictures. For the twenty to forty age group. We found that they tended to score more in the middle range, around three. We found that out of the three groups, the most likely to be favourably affected by the images—that is, they were more likely to score the images as five—were those aged fifty and above. And nobody in this age group failed to say what their reaction was, which was unique for the three groups in total. I have to say that about seventy-one people indicated that they had no reaction at all to an image. Our general conclusion is that we need to find out more about why people react as they do, by perhaps giving them a chance to give reasons for their decisions. I would like to finish there and give my teammates a chance to add anything I have missed, or take any questions or suggestions. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
That is the end of the listening test.